Hi everyone, I'm Lena Sisko with the Profiler Task Force. And tonight we are profiling Drew Peterson, then retired Bolingbrook, Illinois police sergeant, now convicted murderer. Drew Peterson. I walk into that everywhere I go and there's this little hum that goes through the establishment. There's Drew Peterson, there's Drew Peterson, there's Drew Peterson. I'm joined tonight by my fellow profilers, Janine Driver, Susan Ibis, and Michelle Dresbold, and we are the Profiler Task Force. Before we get into our analysis, Janine, tell us about yourself. Thanks, Lena. Uh, my background's ATF, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, 17 years. I left ATF at the age of retired early at 38 and wrote a book called You Say More Than You Think. I say the first New York Times bestselling author I ever met is me. I was at a mall in New Jersey, the Palisades Mall, and, I, and my phone was lighting up for a 212 number, and I knew that was New York. And I answered, and my publisher said, hey, your book just made number nine on the New York Times bestsellers list. And uh, from there, everything changed. I was on Rachel Ray and the Today Show. But when Rachel Ray sat on my lap on a segment, my life changed forever. So today I'm a published author and I help corporate America. I help single men and women, single parents, and uh, I help people just like you on the home front. Make smarter decisions, trust your gut and your emotional intelligence. You know more than you think. And that's me. Awesome. Janine, pass it to someone. Susan, sister, tell us about yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Susan Iwitz. I'm a human behavior hacker. Some people hack computers, I just choose to hack humans. Uh, my specialty is face reading profiling. That is a new specialty who come together from different, uh, different aspects to know who you are, how you think, how to talk to you, how to communicate with you, even, even though before I met you, I work with lawyers, hostage negotiators, police, sales rep, and realtors to profile everybody in 90 seconds. And I have proof I can do it. And as Michelle, I can see your dirty secrets too. So talking about Michelle, tell us about you. Hi, my name is Michelle Dressfold and I'm the author of Sex, Lies, and Handwriting. And I am a handwriting expert. My specialize in three basic things. The first thing is called handwriting identification. That is who actually wrote a note or who might have forged something. The second thing I do is called thread analysis. And what that is, is how dangerous is a writer? And the third thing I do is called personality profiling through handwriting. And that is through somebody's handwriting, I can pretty much tell every single thing about them, anything that motivates them, holds them back. Um, if they're patient, if they're uh, a criminal, maybe what type of weapon they like to use. I can tell pretty much everything, everything you want to know and a few things you don't. And how about you, Miss Lena Sisko? I am a former Navy Intel officer and I'm also a Marine Corps certified interrogator and I interrogated members of Al Qaeda and Taliban shortly after 9-11 back in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Since that time, I have been training special forces, law enforcement, government agencies, and the military in interrogation, interviewing, elicitation, and detecting deception. I'm also a published author, and I've worked on a TV show for three years. I had a lot of fun, and I was catching liars at that point. And so here we are all together. Thank you, ladies, for introducing yourself, and let's get into the case. So before I share a little background history on Drew Peterson, I want to tell you a little bit about us. We have been practicing our craft for decades, and we are used to traveling the world, speaking, training, investigating, and interviewing until the pandemic hit. And when it hit, we decided to join forces and create the Profiler Task Force. The upside is now we get to spread our knowledge with a much wider audience, and that's all of you. So we are here to increase your awareness. Why? Because tonight's show, I want you to be able to identify what a narcissist sounds like and looks like. Can you really trust your spouse, your neighbor, your coworker? Most everyone at some point has heard the term narcissist, but by definition, it's someone who has a very inflated view of themselves, okay? And they have an excessive need for attention and admiration, and they have little regard for other people's feelings. They often have a sense of entitlement, and sometimes they feel that they can get away with anything, even murder. I'm honored to host this month's shows and especially honored to host tonight's episode, which is on a narcissist who thought he could get away with murder. But thankfully for an autopsy and DNA evidence, he didn't. 
So before I dive in, I want to thank all of our followers and our subscribers and a uh, special thanks to our Patreon members. So it's a paid subscription service and we're going to give you more information on that during this episode. But first, I'm gonna give a special shout out to our Patreon ambassadors who just joined. So Deborah, Lisa, Nancy, Teresa, Shannon, Carol, Margaret, Cynthia, Sarah, Karen, Amy, Dawn Marie, Mary Elizabeth, Christina, and Lauren. Thank you guys. So let's begin with some background information on Drew Peterson. He is our profile target for tonight. And I bet you if he knew we were doing this, he would be gloating in his cell right now. So I've created a timeline of events to bring us all up to speed to present day. So let's take a look at that. All right, everyone. So here is a timeline of Drew Peterson's life. So in 1974, he meets Carol Brown. They married and divorced in 1980 after Brown learned about Peterson's infidelity. Together, they had two sons, Stephen Paul Peterson and Eric Drew Peterson. In 1982, he meets Vicki Connolly. They married and divorced 10 years later. Vicki and her daughter alleged a history of domestic violence during this marriage. And when Stacy went missing, Connolly came forward and said, told police that during their marriage, Drew Peterson threatened to kill her and make it look like an accident. And then May 3rd, 1992, he meets Kathleen Savio. He was cheating on Vicki with Kathleen. And only two months after he divorced Vicki, he marries Kathleen. They also have two sons, Thomas and Christopher. It was reported that between 2002 and 2004, police were called out to the Peterson house 18 times for domestic disturbance calls, 18. So let's go to 19 nine, or 2001. So in 2001, Drew begins an affair with Stacy. He's still married to Kathleen Savio. So October 10th, 2003, Kathleen divorces Drew and she writes the Will County State's Attorney's Office saying that she fears Peterson's gonna kill her. Drew marries Stacy, who at the time was 19 years old. He was 49, and they have two children. And then we go to March 1st, 2004. Kathleen Savio's body is found in the bathtub, and she's dead. Around the time of Savio's death, Stacy awakens to find Peterson missing. Prosecutors say, and this is why I quote this, she calls his cell phone, but he doesn't answer. And then he returns home after midnight dressed all in black and carrying a bag of women's clothes that don't belong to Stacy. So August 2007 comes around. Stacy meets with a reverend and she tells the reverend that Drew coached her to provide a false alibi for him and his whereabouts that night. And then we go to October 29th, 2007. Stacy goes reported missing. October 31st, two days later, Will County State's Attorney James Glasgow announces a plan to review Savio's death. So November 13th of that same year, 2007, they exhume Kathleen Savio's body. On February 21st, 2008, James Glasgow announces a pathologist has determined Savio's death as a homicide, not an accident. On May 7th, 2009, Drew is charged with murdering Kathleen Savio. And September 6, 2012, she, he's finally found guilty of her murder. And on February 21st, 2013, Drew is sentenced to 38 years in prison. On February 9th, 2015, Peterson is charged with two additional felonies regarding trying to put a hit on James Glasgow and also the lead who's the lead prosecutor in the murder trial and also for hiring a person to kill this guy, All right? So two accounts. And at that point, he's found guilty of solicitation of murder and murder for hire. And he gets an additional 40 more years in prison. And so where is he today? Well, uh, January 19th, 2018, the Illinois Supreme Court again upheld the conviction of Drew Peterson for the 2004 murder of Kathleen Savio, his third wife. All right, Michelle, so I wanna hear what you found out in viewing and analyzing Drew Peterson's handwriting. Oh, well, he has a very interesting handwriting. In fact, why don't we look at the very first slide? Okay, what we have here is a last will and testament 
of, written by Drew Peterson. And I want to point out a few very interesting things about this glass will and testament. Why don't we look at the very first second slide? What I'm pointing out here is what we call segmented letters. If you look at the word desire, you see that the R is kind of have a big gap and the M in testament has, that it just doesn't connect. And a lot of the letters don't connect. What that means, and I want to go into one in particular, in general, it means that the person goes along and you talk to them and somehow they have a gap between what's really happening and reality. You go, you said this to me and I'll go, no, I didn't. You go, yes, you did. They have a gap between what really happened and what they really think. And, and when you talk to them, you kind of go a little crazy because they gaslight you. But what's more important than in the body of writing is when you have a signature or the letter I that is broken apart, you have a person who basically almost has two personalities. They are split from reality. Now look at Drew, the way Drew wrote his first name. Look at the D. You can't get much more split than that D. If you find separated gaps like that, whether it's in the letter I, meaning me, myself, and I, and there's a break, or in the signature, you're almost always dealing with a very dangerous person who really is not in the same reality as you. Why don't we look at the next slide? I found this slide, I, what I did, and I took out certain things from that last will and testament. Um, and this is really on his, the way he writes his name or his initials. You look at that first thing, those are his initials. Um, I want you to look at the very last, I'm gonna call it a symbol. Again, handwriting is sim symbolic of what's coming out of our brain. And as I mentioned before in my introduction, when we have a criminal or somebody who's not the nicest person in the world and they put in weapons, actual things that look like weapons. I want you to look at the first initial. It almost looks like a sickle. And look at the P in Peterson. It looks like a club. And frankly, the very last thing, which you'll see, I think it looks like a knife. These are called weapon-shaped letters. When you see weapon-shaped letters, you better just put on your shoes and start running. I also just thought this was interesting after Peterson, and you can't really see it, but there's a little period after his name. When you put a period after your name, it can be good and it can be bad, but what it means is what I say, that's what it is, period. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Now, what I did here, I wanted to show that weapon-shaped letters, people were asking, well, Michelle, you do handwriting in English. What about German or Arabic or Chinese? And especially symbols, it doesn't matter what language you're talking about. If you see letters that look like weapons, you are dealing with a very dangerous person. I pointed out um, the bottom, I think it's an F, I'm not quite sure. It's obviously German. Now this is uh, the handwriting of Joseph Mengele, who was known as the angel of death from the concentration camps. He did experiments on children, a horrible, horrible man. You don't you have to know German. All you have to see is a symbol in a handwriting that looks like a weapon. If you ever see that, just run away. Don't give that person a second chance. Some things in handwriting, well, maybe this, maybe that. This is one of those that there's no maybes. You're dealing with a dangerous, dangerous person. Michelle, that was amazing. I swear, every time I listen to you, I learn something new. Last week, we were talking about Chris Watts and you saw phallic symbols. And this week you see weapons. I don't think I would have seen it. So I'm glad yeah. that you shared this with us. And also um, the fact with the split letters, Wow, that makes me think of a correlation between a Gemini. I don't know if you know a lot about signs, but Geminis are said to have the, like the twins and they have a split personality as well. Have you ever seen that in a Gemini? Um, I, I don't know that much about that being in a Gemini. I've always seen that in people who are dangerous. So if you're a Gemini and you have it, 
uh, you know. <laughs> so hopefully most Geminis maybe have some sort of different personalities, but they're not completely split like that. I'm I a see- Gemini. All right, oh, yeah. well, Janine, let me turn it over to you. What questions do you have for Michelle? First of all, I'm a Gemini, but I say I have the good girl and then the naughty girl, Ooh. you know, so, I, and I'm the extrovert introvert. So I'm not like the, you know, straight and narrow and the psychopath, uh, but I definitely have both sides with that Gemini. I remember one time my mother said, I said to my mother, it's not easy having you as an Aries mother. You take everything so personally, like I'm offending you. She was, yeah, you think it was easy raising a Gemini daughter with your two personalities? So, <laughs> uh, Michelle, I really enjoyed it. I, I come from a, sadly, a family of some abuse and uh, my grandmother, my mother's uh, mother, my Nana Lays, uh, her husband, my dad, my mom's father um, beat her up, uh, smashed a TV before. And my mother was raised without her father when he was dying years later, um, came and lived with us. My mom was from Canada originally. And so the, the, the father, his name was Francis Lays, came and lived with us in his last couple of days of, of life. He was dying and the Salvation Army reached out. So when I was listening to you, I was thinking, A, about that. I wonder what was happening in his handwriting. B, I was thinking I have a family member who ended up being in a battered relationship. I dated a hotshot lawyer out of Connecticut that beat me up and uh, like punched my heart. I talked about this once on Nancy Grace, like held me down while he was like strangling me, started punching my heart as hard as he could. And uh, thank God I used to uh, fight with my two younger sisters because I did this move where I put my leg up, you know, (laughs) like when my sisters would hold me down, I'm like dangle spit from their mouth, you know, and I'd put my leg over them. It literally saved my life. And I remember going out in his driveway, the the, um, garage door was open ran out in the driveway. I thought I was having a heart attack. I was young, 20. So I think I was 22 and I couldn't breathe. I was like, <gasps> and this, the elevator, um, the garage door slowly lowered. And he said, I hope you die out there. And it was at the end of a cul-de-sac. And so watching and what you had to say for me was um, like near and dear to my heart on many levels. So thanks for sharing. It made me um, think, boy, if I could go back in time and have the information you shared, maybe I could have made smarter decisions sooner on. I I think the biggest mistake is when we overlook it up front, you know, we already see something. I think there's this great quote, something like, um, you know, Maya Angelou says, people show you who they are, pay attention the first time. How the relationship begins is how it will end. So the thing you didn't like in the beginning is the thing that will end the relationship. So if we could just spot what you shared, we can make smarter yeah, decisions. Yeah, I, I did want to just say one thing, and maybe it's a little different than what um, my Angelo said. You can't always tell what somebody's like in the beginning. Some people put on a very, very good show. Take Drew Peterson. He got four women who married him. He must have put on a better show than beating them up. What I told people, and I'll tell you and everybody out there, that before you get involved, before your heart goes out, look at the handwriting, read sex lies and handwriting, send the handwriting to me. Because once you're involved, you can't think straight. Your heart, your emotions take over. So before you're involved, evaluate the person. You certainly don't want to get into a situation. And if I had just seen that split D on Drew, I would know, goodbye. Mm -hmm. There's not any question, none. So once you're involved, you make all kinds of excuses. Well, maybe he's pretty nice. Well, he did buy me this pretty gift. Oh, he gave me this. Or he's usually nice. So I don't believe on first glance it you can read a person. I really, I think many people put up a very, very, very good show. So um, look at their handwriting. Look at for me too, like... I, I work for law enforcement. I was working for ATF, you know, putting, putting, you know, investigating firearms trafficking. Think about the blame and shame. So if you're on the home front and you've been in a, an abusive relationship, give yourself a break, just like Michelle's saying, and people like me, because I was embarrassed. I wouldn't have talked about it for decades. And, and I'm like, listen, if it happens to me, and I was trained to read people, and I still got myself in an abusive relationship. It can happen, especially if you come from a background of abuse. It can happen to anybody. Yeah, wow. Susan, do you have any questions for Michelle? Um, something to reinforce what the girl says, when people say, I hate online dating, and this is the best that can happen to you. You can bet the person before you dump in on the swimming pool without to knowing if you have sharks on the water. 
uh, if you're in, if you are prepared enough, if you watch shows like this, where you can start picking and seeing things and warning signs, you have a distance to determine like, before I put my heart here, I need to put my head here. Guilty, I have done mm -hmm. that. So one of the things that I like about online dating is like, I can get distant, read the profile, watch the picture, have a couple of conversation. If it doesn't click right, it's not right. So right. one of the things is, Trust your guts, like Janine says, between your guts and your brain, you have so many directions. Don't stop on the heart. That's what can kill you. Mm -hmm. Second of all, I never realized from all the time that we talk, Michelle, that handwriting is handwriting. Doesn't matter what is the language. And mm -hmm. I need to own my, my ignorance. Then I never ask you that. Doesn't mm -hmm. matter what language you write in. Right. Uh, the signs are there. And happen the same with face reading. Doesn't matter what language you are talking their signs is are there too. So um, I'm happy that you bring something bright, wrote in another language. So that shows that has nothing to do with your um, nationality or your gender. You are who you are and you're hiding the monsters really well right. sometimes. And your brain, job, your brain puts out what, and at least in handwriting, your brain puts out what's in your mind onto a page. And so that's why I love it so much because here it is. I can read your brain right from what you put on that page. So, and, and like you said, I, any language, it's all this, it's not always English is a little easier for me, but sometimes other languages are, you know, you see those a few signs, it's exactly means exactly the same thing. I have a question for you, Lena. Uh, my, my mentor in linguistic, um, you, I have a mentor in linguistic, you was my teacher on a deeper level. Um, they says that it doesn't matter what the language the statement is given, you need to translate it to English because it's the best way to determine when someone is lying because English, English is so succinct that if you have a good translator or court translator, it's gonna be easy to find lies and deception in English than in any other language. Have you have done any study on that? No studies, and I don't know if I actually believe that because here's the deal. When you get into other languages, and at one point I spoke five, um, you start getting into a lot of idiosyncrasies and even how we um, place our nouns, verbs, and adjectives is completely different. And then we have ways of saying things in other cultures that just cannot translate into English. So, I mean, I know this when I was an interrogator and a lot of my Arabic speaking detainees, what they told me, you couldn't translate into English. It would make no sense. So you really have to look at it from their language and how they structure their language. But that's a great question because I get so that. It's important to know where the, per the people come in from before it says, liar, pants on fire. Like, wait a minute, what is your original language would be important? So I always tell people, get to know the person. And that means you have to know their culture. So you have to know all the cultural norms, uh, what to say, what not to say, what's taboo, and also how they speak. And so if you don't know it, then get somebody who does. So I had the fortunate experience of working with a lot of interpreters, and they saved me because they imparted all of their knowledge onto me. Thank you. Question. Thank you. All right, ladies, let's turn over to Susan Ibis now. Susan, I'm dying to hear and see what you see in Drew Peterson's face. So I'm looking forward to this. It's funny, like always, most people maybe don't know, but we we know we talk about the topic we're gonna talk. We know what we're gonna be talking about, but we don't share what we're gonna be seeing on the analysis. And it's always blown my mind away how we can get to the same conclusions from all the channels that you're gonna find out on behavior. Because one of the richness of this show is you have all the channels, all the possibilities. The one you like, take them. The one you don't, fast forward. So here's my analysis about, about Drew Peterson. Thank you, Lena. And let's go back to the past, because I think that if we don't review the past, we cannot know the, the, the present and our faces change. Most people fight with this concept, but every seven years, our face change. And every, mel uh, every milestone that we have in our life, our face change. But some people, like in the case of Drew Peterson, there are th certain things that didn't change, they go worse. Now, I know uh, you guys like my arrows, so I put it, what do you feel the upper lip is happening? 
I know you guys who did the do uh, body language, tell me, that is a real smile or it's a forced smile? It doesn't look real to me. Forced, forced, because there's no wrinkles around the eyes. Well, it's called full sincerity, hide their true feelings. So in face reading, we have a way to read the same way that you have in body language girls uh, when it's not sincere. So when you have the upper lip stretch, like, and that's smile, it's because you're hiding your true feelings. Even though you're showing your tooth and like in, in body language and in, in micro expression, you need to cross feed. But in this case, I just need to see your mouth to know that you're not sincere. Now, I've been doing like measurements in his face because I know it's important. And I know people went ballistic with symmetry and we're gonna talk about that uh, after that. We call, we have three zones on the face. Zones one is between your hairline to your eyebrows. Zone two is between your eyelid and your eyebrows and your, the tip of the nose and the tip of the nose to your chin. If you can see the line, you're gonna see that I threw the three lines and I do a middle line. Why? Because I wanna show you the measurements that I do. Why? Because like every muscle, the brain needs to be trained. And in this case, your eyes need to be trained like your brain to see those things. So you can be aware, like the concept of the show is help you to protect yourself, your asset, your loved ones. In this case, he is intelligent, but not that much. And most people says, oh, he was brilliant. Like, wait a minute. Someone who has to do with thinking doesn't mean that if this stone is not big, you're not intelligent. You're compensated with other things. He was an extremely emotional person. You know that? Now, being emotional, not always is good. How many times any, any of you has been around an emotional friend that are crying and complaining like, oh my God, stop it. It's gone. Don't be so emotional. Don't take it personal. It's not about you. It's done. Well, this was the kind of person. He take absolutely everything emotional and everything to the heart. So his first son, he wasn't too much intelligent. He was more about procedure. That's the reason he can get away with the first one and disappear the second body, but still they get caught. Second son is the feelings. You see, he's more emotional, but most of all, he was a doer. Thinking, emotion, and doing. So he was about to doing things. Another thing, he had a big, uh, big chin. You can measure the chin here. Do you know what I mean? Assertive, competitive, physical, physical tough. He was a physical person. Now, if you put these features with other features, you have somebody who can even be reading as a bully. Another thing he have, he have a big jaw. You see here, he have a big jaw, meaning that he have tenacity as a bulldog, committed to his ideas. Now, that can be good ideas or bad ideas. Another thing, you can see the square, uh, the square chin. You can see on the picture before, he had a square chin when he was younger. You see, there's like a line, square chin. Now what he did with time is re-emphasize and decorate that square chin to be looking way more aggressive. Goes all or their goals. It's my way or the highways. Their ideals are principles coming first. Now, two things that we never saw in another picture before because we didn't have mock job. You see the inclination of the ears? That means that he have a unique look on life. So you can be fine in the cure of cancer or you think is your way or the highway again. Now we start putting together square chin, big jaw, big chin, the asymmetry on the face, different things, and he was a doer. Now, you see the chin is recidivated, is like back, do you know what I mean? That is a person to avoid conflicts. So we are talking about that every time that he have a conflict, he get rid of the wife. Make sense what I'm saying? When you want somebody who wanna avoid conflict, 
you have your own way because he have his own way to think about it to avoid conflict. Now, we're gonna talk about symmetry. Remember we talked last was about symmetry? Can you tell me, ladies, if we have the same size of ears, the same height and the same shape? Can you see the differences? Yes. Now, we're gonna go to another differences, meaning that he was processing information in taking information in different way. And he was listening in one way in his personal life and seeing what he listened in his business life in a different way. Now, can we see the eyes and can we see the mouth? Straight mouth is meaning that he's reserved and he's very careful when he speak. He's not, it's not that he was an intelligent, but he knows that you only can be prosecuted for the things that come from your mouth. Hey, he was a police. He knows that he need to shut up. So you see the mouth stretch between the upper lip and the mouth straight. He didn't talk even his life depend on it. Now he have a big mouth. So he was sugar coating your ears. And that's the reason he have four victims on his life that he married beside the one he had before and after. And the last thing that we're gonna talk, I don't know if you can really perceive, remember that we were talking about the, the, the hiding lines, you see these lines that he hide by the mustache? Those are secret lines. Now, it's funny, and again, what I'm saying is funny, it's not I'm doing funny about the situation, it's just like, it's like blown my mind that he was always, always cover the upper lip with a mustache. He keep feelings hiding. And every time that he smile, he straight the upper lip. So between the upper lip to be stretched and hiding the upper lip that has to do with feelings, that's the way he managed his life. Last one. And I love Lena that you did a timeline because I did the same. This is Drew Peter Peterson from 2008, 2014. You can see the mouth. It's always hiding. And another common denominator, he changed his hair, he changed his a uh, lot of things in his face, but never ever changed the upper lip. He never showed his feelings. His mouth is never gonna reveal. I don't think that we're gonna see ever in this case where he hide his four wife. Why? Because he knows that his mouth is his worst enemy. Wow, Susan, again, amazing. So we hear from Michelle Dresbold, our handwriting expert, and now we hear from you, Susan Ibitz, our face reading expert, and you guys basically said the same thing, right? So Michelle, you talked about these split letters and having these two personalities. What do we usually see on the news and on TV and on YouTube and all the videos of Drew? This calm, cool, collected guy laughing about his missing wives and so overly uh, boastful about not having anything to do with it. And then Susan, you say, well, wait a minute, this guy's very emotional and he's got the secret lines. So there's that huge dichotomy, right? We see, and he tries to portray that strong, calm, cool, collected, but obviously there's another side to him, isn't there? He was really so, needy. Uh, Actually, he still is. If one another thing that he had, and I didn't point it because I don't want to go through all the, the, the features in one phase, but when you have a person who have a lot of exposed eyelids and they have a zone too really big, it's a person who's needy, he need attention, he need companionship, and he cannot be holding the solitary. So he always looked for a companion. He was really emotional. The problem when you put emotional with my way or the highway and the aggressiveness he have is like, you abandon me. You don't like, uh, uh, you don't care about me and you having babies. So I'm not, uh, now I'm not the center of the attention. Again, it's not that you are gonna have exposed eyelids and you're gonna become a serial killer. What I'm saying is, again, it's a combination, but when you have feelings and expose eyelid, expect a person who's going to be volatile about the feelings and they need to be the center of the attention. And if this is a man and the woman start having kids, that's when conflicts are going to start happening. Makes perfect sense. Janine, do you have any questions for Susan? Oh, it was fascinating. I took out a hundred pages of notes right here, <laughs> listening. <laughs> I was taking some. I have, I have questions we'll ask in Patreon tonight. So thank you. Okay, Susan. cool. Good, good, good. Michelle, do you have any questions for Susan? No, not really. Uh, my only other question might be 
you said emotional and I, I, I sometimes think of him, somebody like him, it's emotional, but it's defensiveness, his own emotions, not emotional of understanding other people's emotions. That's what I'm saying when you combine it with the exposed eyelid and it's my way or the highway, I have all the rights. It's like, oh, you hurt my feelings. I need right. to be the center of the attention. He was emotional. He, because he didn't have thick lips, it wasn't mm -hmm. about other people emotion. It was about mm -hmm. me, 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 right. first me and last me. I need to be the center of the attention. And if you, I usually don't watch cases because I don't want to be biased. But in this case, I need to corroborate something. And when I saw the interviews, like, okay, we have a winner. Uh, the reading is right. It was about me, poor me, poor me, poor me, poor me. That's exactly. it, that it is Drew Peterson because the monster is still inside. Just he's in inside jail. Thank God. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Janine, uh, I'm dying to hear from you. Let's talk about movement pattern analysis or body language. What do you got for us? So I'm not talking about his MPA, his movement pattern analysis profile, although he'd be interesting one to profile in order us, for us to profile. We need two hours of footage of you sitting down and Lord knows we probably have way more than that with you, Peterson, because this guy could not go on the Today Show or Larry King or any other show that was in existence while he was out and free uh, and do another interview. But today I will be talking about an emotion that you talk, spoke about before, Lena, which is contempt. And I want to go a little deeper on contempt and and um, where does that show up with regard to marriages? Where does it show up with coworkers, even terrorism, terrorism and um, some other definitions? And I think even you, Lena, might be surprised to learn, you know, contempt isn't as easy as we may have thought it was. So let's dive in and look at Drew Peterson leaking contempt. Can you spot it? I'm going to show you what it looks like first. And then I'm going to play a, a clip for about a minute and a half and see if you can spot it. Uh, these micro expressions happen really fast, even in like a third of a second, they can happen. And here's the deal. As we all know, you once you learn about contempt, you can never unsee it. So let's dive in and look at Drew. Contempt, I often dub contempt this moral superiority, but I often say it's the it's the kiss of death. We think of contempt as disdain or scorn. And um, it's something you'll be hearing all of us, all the profiler women here talking about contempt at one point or another during our program, the Profiler Task Force. I'm gonna go a little deeper. You know, when there's a lot of studies on contempt, I'll go over those in a second. John Gottman talks about it at the Gottman Institute out of um, the Seattle, Washington area. And what does it have to do with your spouse? You know, if you have contempt in a marriage, it's likely that your marriage will result in a divorce. Uh, contempt in a marriage, it's connected with, you know, this, you think your spouse is absurd or you think they're incompetent or, or they're beneath your dignity and you believe that your spouse is just like, is nothing, is trash. It's literally called det det detached cold hatred. So I want you to imagine that. Like, have you ever been in a relationship where you have felt detached, cold hatred. I'm sure you have at one point or another. And if you're a mother of a teenager, you're probably feeling it now because they leak contempt quite a bit. So let's talk about the two different sides of contempt in just a minute. Let's first show you what contempt looks like. It's the only unilateral expression that shows up on our face. There's seven universal emotions. Um, this sometimes is at a debate. Uh, it started first with Dr. Paul Ekman. He talked about the six universal emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, and disgust. He later added number Number seven, which is contempt. I've personally trained with Dr. Paul Ekman, and um, he taught me. I was able able to spot contempt, but the uh, the difference between fear and surprise were tougher for me. And we'll be talking about that in a future episode. So let's look at Drew here. There's no sound on here. I'm just going to loop this for you. See if you can spot it. It's very subtle on his face. You can't unsee it though. Contempt is that smirk on the face. Sometimes people say that cat, cat ate the canary grin. And you feel it if you're looking at him when he makes this tiny little micro movement over here, this micro expression right there, it's pulled in. You feel that smugness, right? You just feel like, oh, I don't like guys like this, right? Like, you jerky piece of crap. You feel that detached, cold hatred. He's talking about his, um, this right here, 
here is talking about his third wife, Kathleen Savio. They exhumed her body and determined that it was murder. And when being asked about this, he leaks contempt. So what I want to do now is I'm going to play the clip. And it's about a minute, minute and a half. And I want to see if you can spot it. I often, and I know Michelle likes this when I share this, I like to um, run the video first. And I just kind of speed through it back and forth to see what might be popping out for me. And then I like to back up maybe five seconds, sometimes 10 seconds to see, okay, I would spot this contempt very easily. And I will back up five to 10 seconds and say, okay, what is he contemptuous about? So contempt, moral superiority. Are we saying you are an honorable police officer? You won awards. You brought down the Latin Kings or you brought down, like, are we singing his praises? If we're singing someone's praises, we, contempt makes sense there, right? Because you win this award, you're the top salesperson. Don't think the top salesperson when they get the trophy for being like the top 1% of the top 1% and they leave contempt, but don't be like, oh my God, don't date that guy, he's a killer. No. It belongs there. It's that I worked my butt off for this. Of course, contempt will be here. So let's see if you can spot contempt here. So first, I'm going to show you just what contempt looks like on some different people. So you can see here, even Simon Cowell, he leaks contempt quite a bit. I love Simon Cowell, but he leaks contempt quite a bit, right? If you are on stage and you are singing, do you think Simon Cowell with this expression is impressed with your singing or the person who's on stage? Let me ask the ladies, the profilers, what do you think? If, if someone was on stage singing and we saw Simon Cowell with this face, do you think he's impressed with their singing? I, I know he's going to push the button if he's out. No, you all talk at the same time. Susan, go. Uh, he's going to push the button and you're out. You're not good he's gonna, enough. He's going to, well, if he pushes the button and you're out, then the pushing the button, I think, on this show was you get to go to the next round. Lena, what do you think? Well, then he's not pushing a button because <laughs> yeah. he is not liking what's going on. Yeah. What about you, Michelle? I think he just heard how I sing. So <laughs> <laughs> he's like, you got to be kidding me. Do we not have gatekeepers at the show? How is this person on front on stage? <laughs> All right. And does anyone know who this is out of the profilers in the top right, right above Simon Cowell? Do you know who this guy is? I don't Do remember him. I forgot. I know who he is. I forgot. He was so smug. Um, uh, in Michelle. Light Michelle. I, don't, I don't know who he is. His name is Screlly, and he's the guy that took this drug and like jacked the prices through the roof. Yes. He's in jail. I think he's still in jail today. Um, his smugness was unbelievable. So Screlly, we even see Lance Armstrong doing a, a little bit of contempt here along with, you know, some embarrassment, I think. This is A-Rod when he was lying to Katie Couric about taking steroids. He later said to Katie, how could I tell you the truth when I was so busy lying to myself? He, I show this one quite a bit. And then if you're going to something a little more recent, Jesse Smollett, he leaked contempt a lot in his interview with, I want to say it was um, ABC in Good Morning America when he was being interviewed, contempt, moral superiority. And then back to uh, Bernie Madoff, his smirk was often seen as contemptuous, which is interesting because if you were to hear an interview with Bernie Madoff, he will be the first person to tell you that he's happier in jail than he was out and about. And of course, someone like Bernie Madoff will say something like that, that contemptuality, right? That contemptness, it totally makes sense. I'm not surprised that you'd hear it. So let's talk about this powerful emotion contempt before we go into Drew Peterson a little more for you to spot it. There's studies have been done, Lena, on what's called dispositional contempt, right? So we think of contempt as like this big mothership, right? And we know that John Gottman proved marriages are going to fail. Um, that study he did in 1994. There's also been studies that coworkers feel shamed, right? If you're shaming a coworker, that's Mulwaney and Barsade. And I apologize for saying these names wrong. I'm from Boston. I don't even say words with the letter R correctly. That study was in 2011. There was even a study about contempt with terror back in 2011 with a researcher by the name of Tausch, T-A-U-S-C-H. I'm going to say Tausch. Okay, so this powerful emotion of contempt, ladies, is um, a decrease in satisfaction when it comes to marriage, this lower commitment. Now, there's this dispositional contempt, and some research has been done on this, like with regard to your personality, and um, it's when you, uh, you know, derogate others um, who violate your standards, right? So if you have certain standards, you're putting them down because you feel like they're beneath you. I sometimes drop F-bombs. I'm working on it. 
Although I did buy the website, swearingchristian.com. There's nothing there. I actually want to put just one thing, like an F-bomb, like F-U-C-K, you found me, you know, something simple since I already own the website. I'm working on my swearing. Um, but it's creating distance. It's when you are looking down on someone. But contempt also is when you're angry or you're envious or you have excessive pride. So it's not just I'm contemptuous about you. It's I might be angry. I might be jealous. I might be overly prideful, right? It makes sense when I win an award, but when I'm getting away with murder, it might not belong there. Here's the other side of the coin though, Lena, Michelle, and Susan, and you at home is people who leak contempt are often cold and they feel superior, right? So we can see that of course with you, Peterson, we can even see that maybe with some of these people I have on our screen here, this moral superiority. Guess what, Lena? Narcissists. So the number one emotion you'll see on the face out of the seven universal emotions, happiness, sadness, fear, surprise, anger, contempt, and disgust that show up on our face in similar ways. Number one for the narcissist is contempt. Mm -hmm. Also, it, you might not be a narcissist, but you may be, Lena, and I think you might be here a little bit, a perfectionist. Are any of you perfectionists? Sometimes perfectionists, I know Lena, you're like, you, you say you're a word nerd, right? Like, so perfectionists will often leak contempt, right? So you might go to someone's house and you might look and you might not put that plant right over there, or you wouldn't put the silverware so far away from where the, where the kitchen is, right? You're like cooking here at the stove. This, your brain starts thinking, oh, I would put all my silverware here. So you may leak contempt in those moments, Lena. And it doesn't mean that you look down on them. It doesn't mean that you're a narcissist. It just means you might have a perfectionist thing that's kicking in. It's like, mm, I don't know if I would put the silverware way over there when the stove is over here. Uh, my house, for instance, my dishwasher, when I'm unpacking my dishwasher, the designer who designed the kitchen, the, the cabinet where all the dishes go are right here. I literally cannot open the dishwasher and put everything away. I have to put it all over my countertop, close the dishwasher, and then put my dishes away. So if you have a perfectionist thing and you come to my house when you're putting away the dishes, you might have leak contempt, that perfectionism. A couple more things before we go in again to the video, because I wanted to dive deeper because we do talk about contempt quite a bit. Antisocial tendencies. So with racism. So if you right now, you know, if you are looking at, you know, whether you voted for Biden or, or Trump, and you're talking about the politics, if you're talking about racism, um, racist, racists will often leak contempt when talking about racism. If you're talking about someone, say, with Black Lives Matter, and they're like, yeah, yeah, I believe Black Lives Matter, and they leak contempt, there's more to the story there. So if I were you, I would unpack that if it was something that you were interested in being friends with this person or not. So um, if you're a disagreeable person in general, you probably leak contempt. I got to tell you, I get rid of these people pretty quickly. Here's the, the shocking part, and I'm interested, I want to hear from Lena and Michelle and Susan on this, is I'm wondering, and you at home, I'm wondering if you're surprised to learn that people who also leak contempt, and this is something we've never talked about on the show, I don't think I've even talked about it when I had Celebrity Lie Detector Live, are people who are self-deprecating, people who are emotionally fragile, people who have low self-esteem, they have insecure attachment, and they feel like other people expect them to be perfect. And when you're calling them out, these self-deprecating, emotionally fragile, low self-esteem people, and you're talking to them, They'll do this almost like I think like we're seeing here with Lance Armstrong, I think even though we'd see traditional contempt with him like we see with Jesse Smollett or we see with Simon Cowell or we see with with some of the other people on the screen. This particular contempt that we see on this picture, if I had to guess. I would say this is him kind of being emotionally fragile. This is the interview Lena when he was coming clean with Oprah. It's not just the it's that combination of biting his lip at the same time. So does it, does it surprise you, Lena, about that people who are fragile in this low self-esteem and they, they, they're worried about being perfect, you know, and, and they feel bad about themselves. Does it surprise you that they leak contempt as well? Totally. Because you know, I get the hatred. I see it. And usually it's a, a great indicator that you just lied to me, but I never stopped and thought that it could actually indicate somebody who is fragile emotionally. Never knew it. 
Right. And, you know, until I prepared for this and, you know, we all want to go deeper and deeper, you know, we already come in with a certain expertise, but I know all four of us profilers are the eternal students and re new research is co constantly coming out. So yes, this new research about contemptuous people, which really makes me think, you know, where might I have read someone wrong? You know, a woman who, who killed her batterer or um, a, a, a child that came, you know, confronted their mom. And you think your teenager is just being really difficult, but really, what if your teenage daughter, instead of just being a know-it-all, what if she's emotionally fragile? What if she is already self-deprecating and you're yelling at her about something and she's like leaking contempt. And instead of us thinking, Oh, you think you know it all? Instead of us getting aggressive, is it possible, especially with COVID and this pandemic, is it possible some of the people that are leaking contempt right now isn't that they have it all figured out? It's the opposite. It's that they feel so much pressure to be getting it right that they are imploding. So I'm going to, I get emotional about it as a mother of three sons. So I'm going to challenge all of us and you at home to stop and say, um, is this extreme arrogance? Is this like we see with Drew Peterson? Or is there something uh, a little deeper happening here with the decrease in self-esteem and uh, someone feeling like they need to be perfect? All right, let's look at, see if you can find contempt. Contact with Kathleen Savio between 24 and 48 or 36 hours prior to her being discovered dead. Uh, he was a not in contact and we know that he had the children for visitation that weekend so you know he had the children with him all weekend when he wasn't at work. I mean but I can't let him go beyond that. People watching Drew are thinking one of two things. Either you are experiencing the worst string of luck in the history of the world or that you're involved in this deeper than you're letting them. Did you catch it right there? I saw Lena, I, I don't know if they can see you at home, but I certainly saw you do it right here. So this is, again, when I say back up five to 10 seconds, he said, either you're just the worst, you know, you have the worst string of luck or you're a murderer, right? So let's back up and look at that one last Contact time. Contact with Kathleen Savio between 24 and 48 or 36 hours prior to her being discovered dead. Uh, he was a not in contact and we know that he had the children for visitation that weekend. So you know, he had the children with him all weekend when he wasn't at work. I mean, but I can't let him go beyond that. People watching Drew are thinking one of two things. Either you are experiencing the worst string of luck in the history of the world or that you're involved in this deeper than you're letting all right, so my question here would be for you at home, if you're seeing this, is say, okay, well, is he emotionally fragile? Maybe his wife is missing. Is he self-deprecating? No, not really. Is he insecure attachment? Does he feel like other people are expecting him to be perfect? Maybe. Here's the, the I'm gonna land this plane for us now. I want you to notice that body language, and Lena will talk about this as well, is that we're looking for clusters of body language. So it's not just contempt in and of itself. Does his body language show up as insecure and low self-esteem and fearful? No, he's doing like a Mac Daddy, Sharon Stone crotch display, right? It's like coming right at us. Look at his legs. I mean, literally any far apart, he'd have to be on the ground doing a split, right? Crotch display. His, his head is on straight right here. His coat is unbuttoned, right? So he, this is confidence. So we're looking at this. He's giving eye contact to Matt Lauer. There's so much else happening here. I know I'm out of time because I spent so much time on talking about all the different areas of contempt. I just want to show a sneak peek, and I'll go into this a little further tonight with Patreon. I just want to show you at home. Again, I would fast forward here. Look what I'm noticing. I'm noticing a shoulder shrug. So I'm going to talk in Patreon tonight about this shoulder shrug on uncertainty, and I'm going to play it out. What is he uncertain about here? And does his words match his nonverbals? So that shoulder shrug is uncertainty, this adjustment that we're noticing. What is it? Can you spot it? And then okay. what happened? Don't know. This is Lena's category. So Lena, before I turn it over to you, I'd love, uh, I got this for you. I don't know if you're planning on talking about it. He's asked, hey, what happened? What happened? Lena, uh, this is my challenge as I turn it back to you, sister. I'd love for you to share with our fans uh, what's suspicious about this statement? I know I'm blindsiding you, but none of us know what we share before we get here. So let's see how you do at home. And Lena, as I turn it back, I'll play the clip. What's suspicious about his response right here? Here we go. Third wife. Okay. What happened? Don't know. I don't know. Okay. What happened? Don't know. Okay. What happened? Don't know. 
I don't know. She, uh, we got information uh, that she drowned in the bathtub. All right, that's it. I'm going to turn it back to you, Lena. Thanks for playing with me. That was great. Janine, that was amazing. And you put me to the test, so I will answer you. Uh, so number one, he says, don't know. And if you guys have seen any other of our videos on our uh, YouTube channel, you will know that I've already talked about this. There's missing a very important word there. And that word is a pronoun and it is I. He doesn't say, I don't know. He says, don't know. Okay, who doesn't know? So we call that distancing. There's no um, accountability for what he's saying. And he is just, oh, sorry guys, I had a phone call coming in. Um, <laughs> you like that music? So uh, that's number one. Then he does the classic start stop. It's a word slip. He goes to say she, ooh, we, right? Come on. So yeah, and there's so much more and I know I'm going next and last and I will dive into more statement analysis with you. But before I do, thank you, Janine Driver, our body language expert. I want to turn it over to Susan to see if you have any questions for Janine. I have two questions that I expect to talk about in Patreon with Janine. Janine, you and I were the only one chin up and I know for you have a lot of meaning. So I want your analysis and why would the two of us always chin up? And the second one is there is uh, something that I was expecting to them develop in Patreon is about the contempt in face reading have a meaning too and just happen to be the same meaning that in micro expression. The crazy part is face reading was developed 5,000 years ago. We only has been researching micro expression for the last 100 years. How crazy is that everything have a correlation? You wanna know the two questions that I have for Janine? See you tonight at night. By the way, over 400 studies on contempt, and you would think that that's a lot, but contempt is the least studied emotion that we all have in common around the world that shows up similar in our face. With Why? regard to contempt in personality, it's just something new that they're exploring. So a lot of people don't really even can't wrap their brain around contempt. So the research on this was really interesting. I, I enjoyed this week preparing to go deeper on contempt. I learned a lot more. And it makes sense because I can see people when they're insecure or nervous like this. Yeah, I, don't know. Fascinating. I didn't know that, Janine. And you know what? And for all of you watching this, listen, when we talk about indicators, whether it's verbal, nonverbal, whether it's something in the face, whether it is something in their handwriting, a lot of times, especially when it comes to Janine and I's work, it's all contextual. Okay. So you, first of all, she mentioned clusters. You got to look for clusters of indicators. Second, you have to know the baseline and that's how a person is when they are relaxed. Okay. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that tonight in our Patreon meeting. And then you have to figure out the context. There's sometimes people will exude indicators that look like deception, but it's just nervousness because they're emotionally insecure because they, uh, they just went through something traumatic. And the final one, and I mentioned this before, is you have to know the culture. So you have to know cultural norms. Michelle, let me turn it over to you. Do you have any questions for Janine? Janine, do you know what it meant when he answered his last question and went like that and like leaned his body over? So this is what I always do. So first of all, with movement pattern analysis, I'll tell you what it means and it, and it doesn't surprise me. He actually does that movement quite a bit, not as dramatic. I always say, try it on. So if you're listening to someone, say what they said. You know, someone just wrote to me recently an email and said, I would like to engage in one of your classes. I'm like, aren't you fancy? Like who says engage? Like hashtag stay fancy. You know, I want to engage in your class. You know, I say, say what people are saying or do what they're doing. So talk and say, um, I, I really am excited to be here today. I think that's such a great question, Michelle, right? So what happens is we're letting out that energy. So at the very least, we're letting out energy in the movement pattern analysis world. It's called descending. And this is the scales of justice, right? We talked about this in our first episode with RBG. If you haven't seen it, check it out on our YouTube channel, the Profiler Task Force. But our RBG did this movement quite a bit. So these, if you do it a lot, the rising, this is rising, lifting up. I'm, I'm kind of disappearing here, but mm -hmm. rising and descending is connected with my evaluators. And if you're a high evaluator, you're judgmental and you prejudge before you have all the information. But for someone like RBG, you can use that power for good. 
someone like Drew Peterson, you can use that evaluating power for evil. So great question, Michelle. Thank you. Um, um, only one question. When we, I was talking about features that you cannot read only one feature and it's standardized for everybody, it's like you need to put all the pieces together. And I love what you said, Janine, like you have RBG and you have Peterson who maybe have some similitude on the way they move the body is what you choose to do. With your good, when you, with that, with good, with big powers come big responsibilities. Something like that. I remember in Spider Man, and it's the same. You, oh, you decide at many, the end. Do you know how many gangbangers could be CEOs on planet Earth? Do you know how many billionaire potential billionaires if they just had a different beginning, if they just had the right mentor, if they were just at the right time in the right place? There is an art to being respected, and so many leaders of these gangs are well respected. They're able to manage a team. They're able to do something that the everyday person that graduates from Harvard couldn't do in a million years. More so money than we do the four of us together, by the way, too. All right, I am now going to move into my part because I am your statement analysis expert and I'm just going to show you guys a short video clip and I'm going to tell you what I really hear in Drew Peter, uh, Peterson's statements. If you heard this stuff about you as an outsider, what would you think? I'd look at me as a bad guy. Basically, I'm a good person and I've done good things. But the longtime police officer has been named a suspect in the disappearance of his fourth wife, Stacy. Peterson, who has not joined the massive search for his wife, claims her disappearance is nothing sinister. Why would I go out and search for something who I don't believe is there? You know, why would I go beat in the weeds in the cold, which I know is a waste of time? He says she ran off with another man. So you're pretty convinced that nothing bad has happened to her, she's just taken off? Correct. Do you think she's the kind of person who would just take off and leave her children? Do you ever really know somebody? Peterson admits his life with Stacy was volatile. I would say I was controlling, but I wasn't abusive. And that many of their problems were brought on by her depression and PMS. When she was either menstruating, hungry, or tired, she was agitated. And she would ask me for a divorce or talk about divorce on a monthly basis. And then when the cycle passed, she was okay. We were loving and happy. All right, so in seeing that video, I'm going to talk about five tips. So number one, he says, basically, I'm a good person. When somebody uses the word, basically, it just means that they are comparing what they're saying to another thought in their head. Does not mean that you have an automatic liar on your hands, but it does mean that as they're saying the statement, they're thinking another thought. Now, to me, and knowing that Drew Peterson is convicted of a murder, it probably is, I'm not really a good person, right? So basically, I'm a good person. That's number one. Number two, this is what really bothered me. You know, and I've said this before, that when you violate the rules of grammar, something is going on in your head, okay? It's a cognitive overload. When people get super stressed out because they're thinking about what to say or nervous about what to say, you start to violate the rules of grammar. And he says, I'm gonna read it. Why would I go out and search for something who? Doesn't make sense. Something? So when you talk about your wife as a something, that, was, that automatically tells me it is a huge indicator that that person is no longer living because if they were, then the, they, he should have said, if I go out and search for someone, but he didn't, he said something and then changed it, who I know is not there, right? Doesn't make any sense. So the fact that he said something and not someone tells me that he already knows she's not coming back and she is not alive. Number three. He also says, why would I go beat the weeds because it's a waste of time? Okay, I'm sorry, Drew. I thought we were looking for your missing wife, but apparently it's a waste of your time. Okay, so that just tells me where he is in his mind. And then number four, um, he is asked, do you really think that she would go out and leave her two children and run off with this man? His response is answering a question with a question. And we call that a stalling technique and an also a great way to get out of answering a question. And his response is, well, do you really ever know someone? Well, Drew, she was your wife. I'm assuming that you should have known her, but he never answers the question. And the reporter is not trained as an interrogator, does not go back and make him answer the question just simply by rephrasing it and say, oh, Drew, you didn't answer that. So I'll ask you again. And the last one, number five, finally, he gives us a big smoke screen. 
Here you have his fourth wife gone missing. You think he would be worried or care about it. And instead he tells us, well, you know what? Every month we talked about getting divorced because of her cycle. And then she got hangry too, because when she was hungry, she was real volatile. Are you kidding me? So you're going to blame her disappearance on her menstrual cycle and being hungry. Wow. That's a huge smoke screen. What a smoke screen does is it paints this story that Drew is trying to make us see and believe, and it hides the real story. It's also called gaslighting. But those five things just tell me a lot, okay? So I always call myself a word nerd. I do not believe that Drew Peterson is innocent, and he is convicted of murder. Kathleen Savio, I'm pretty certain he murdered Stacey Peterson as well. So we're going to land this plane, as Janine Driver says, and we are going to start to close out the show. But before I do, I'm going to turn it over to my lady profilers, and I'm going to ask them if they have any questions for me. All right, profilers. So Janine, do you have any questions for me? Yeah, you know what? I'm interested, Lena, if when you first followed this case, when it first came out, did you meet like what was your gut instinct right out of the gate and and do you trust your gut instinct or does your brain automatically kind of grab all the data like are you like a computer as it's entering your brain so when i saw him it was his whole demeanor right we call ourselves a profile or task force for a reason and it's because we are looking for patterns and behaviors in people's demeanor and that can be verbal and nonverbal. and his demeanor was not what I should have seen from a husband who does not know where his wife is. The duper's delight, the contempt, the over, um, the smirking, the I'm cool, confident and calling her something and the list goes on and on. So yeah, my gut feeling, guilty. And I don't know, Alina, one more question. At one point, Drew Peterson was going out and giving food and beverages to the media in front of his house. Is that, and, and I know none of us are psychologists, but is that in your experience in, in training law enforcement and the military, is that connected with that narcissism um, of him? You know, you, you're, so I mean, if you think about it, his wife is missing. Uh, he's being, you know, considered a suspect at least by public opinion. And he's bringing out water and treats to the, to the media in front of them. Is, is that? Oh, it certainly could be. In fact, he goes even further, Janine, and I don't know if you saw this. So at one point he says, okay, I'm done media of answering any questions about Stacey. Let's move on to something else. I want a game show. I want a dating game show. Let's, it'll be fun and we'll see who wants to date me. So Susan, what you saw, and I see you scratch your head, what you saw in his face, complete. It's all about me. Who likes me? Who wants me? And when you don't, or when you become hangry and aggravate me, I'm going to move on to someone else. And I yeah. want to re, re I don't want to stress enough that we don't talk about the things before the show because we like our surprise and honest question about like how the heck that match with an inch and time with what we do. So like it's crazy. Uh, even as a part of the profile task force, I get surprised. I cannot imagine how the brain of the people watching this show is going as fast as like what the heck is going on here. Lena, yeah. I, I have to bring this up one more time. It, yeah. The timeline was awesome. I love it. I think we need to do timelines for every show. You, you took it up an, a, a notch. Thank you. You're doing such a great job uh, as the host. Yeah, yeah. I was fascinated that she went and talked to a pastor and then a couple months later, she goes missing Stacy Peterson, the third wife. I'm curious in your research, because I know you're the word nerd researcher. Did you find out, did he groom these women? You know, I know that master manipulators tend to groom people. I have a neighbor that is a little bit of an odd duck. He lives about six houses down from us. And he put four bags of candy at Halloween in the mailbox for my sons. We did not do trick or treating. My dad had COVID almost died. We weren't, we were not doing it. Right. And so we came back, we were at a friend's house and my kids were excited. Even my, my, like my au pairs like, wow, that was so nice of the neighbor. And for me, I think it's from my law enforcement background. I'm curious about you, Lena. For me, I'm like, warning, stop. Like, that's not a good thing. Like, I don't want the neighbor who's the weird duck down the street writing my kids' names on plastic bags full of, you know, 30 pounds of candy for each kid. And by 30 pounds, I mean like 16 pieces. But, and my kids are like, that was so nice. He's so nice. And I'm like, I immediately think grooming. And I'm curious with Drew Peterson in your research as he, you know, won over one woman after another and overlapped. Was he grooming them? Did you find out any data about how they swept, he swept them off their feet? Well, I did find out after he swept Stacy off her feet that he made her get braces and liposuction. 
I, she's 19. Boops, too. Uh, I don't remember. I can't yeah. remember. Probably. He paid for it. Yeah. He paid yeah. for it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. He's like, I want you to look like this, and I'm going to pay for it. A woman I used to work with a long time ago uh, didn't want to do private dan uh, music lessons with the music teacher. And her mother said, you, he's willing to do it for free. You will do it. And she goes, mom, I don't want to do it. I'm uncomfortable. I don't like him. She goes, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. He's willing to do this for free. We don't have the money. We're poor. He was molesting her. So as a young elementary school student, and the mother probably didn't know and, and was like, don't look at gift more. He's trying to help us. So, you know, our good friend, Frank Marsh over at the FBI behavioral unit would tell us overly charming is alarming. Yes. And so if you at home are, you know, being swept off their feet or someone's an and odd neighbor is super nice at Halloween. Too good to be true, Jenny would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Trust your gut, everyone watching. Uh, listen to your kids, listen to your peers and your colleagues and your coworkers and your friends. If they are telling you that it just doesn't feel right, hear them out, right? Because they may not notice what they're seeing, but you may, and especially from watching our videos, now you have some tips and maybe you can educate them and help protect them. Michelle, I haven't asked you, do you have any questions for me? No, but I thought what you said was fascinating and um... And I learned from everybody here on the task force, profile task force, every single time I listen. So thank all of you. Thank you. How about you, Susan? Any questions? Uh, no, I'm blown away. And I realized and I start keep my questions for the, <laughs> for the patron. But yeah, I would say only one. How difficult is to make a baseline when you see someone for the first time? Because most people are like, oh, shoulder shrug or like they do that like most people think I'm lying like I have cats so I tend to kiss my cats before I feel guilty before we're recording because I had it in a room so I kiss them and I do this all the time people are like Susan is lying all the time like no I have cat hair on my face so if you're going to see me and the first time you said oh she's lying all the time like no I have cats in my house so how important is the baseline before to accuse someone about something that maybe like we talked before, is cultural or language or different education? Well, well, two things. It's critical and it doesn't take a lot of time at all. I can get a baseline in 10 minutes. You just have to ask some really good probing questions so you get them to speak and you can observe their body language. And the second thing is, of course, we never accuse anybody, right, of lying. Instead, when we pick up on the fact that somebody has lied to us, we don't go, you're lying, because what are they going to do? No, I'm not, right? Prove it. So instead, we create a very safe environment and we ask probing questions and we unravel the lie and we pull the threads and we create an environment where people said, yeah, you got me. I lied. But yeah, it's Thank critical. You. Critical. All right, ladies, I think it is time to start to wind down and close out this show. All right. So viewers, now you guys know some indicators to look for when it comes to narcissists. As we say, use this knowledge to protect yourself, your family, your friends, and of course, your finances. Thank you all for watching tonight's episode. Next week, we're going to profile Dana Morales, a carn artist, a scammer, a manipulator, and a liar. Tune in to discover some behavioral indicators to look and listen for to protect yourself and those around you from being taken advantage of. Learn to make wise decisions about trusting others. When it comes to entering into a new relationship, hiring a new employee, a babysitter, buying a house, or simply seeking advice from someone. And don't forget, if you like what you see here, subscribe to our channel. You can also become a member of our Patreon family, which is a paid subscription service, but it gives you a very special access to some training material, a chance to win some of our books and a coaching session. And you also get that VIP access to our after party after the show, which we are having tonight at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, you can go to Patreon at patreon.com, profile or task force, but the link is also below as well. We enjoy hearing from all of you and we try really hard to respond to all of your comments. So if we don't, please don't get mad at us. We ask you guys to be very respectful to each other and keep it classy. Um, so I am Lena Sisko again with a profiler task force with my profiler lady, Susan Ibitz, Michelle Dresbold, and Janine Driver. And I want to put one more thing out to you guys. 
please, I want to mention the National Domestic Violence Hotline. We have secured the number below, but it is 1-800-799-SAFE. And Janine just texted this to me. So she said, hey, listen, we want to put this out for our viewers. So it is for you. Please use it. We want to make sure that you guys stay safe. And with that, from all of us to all of you, thank you and have a great night. Hey, 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 hey I got to tell you one thing, Lena. You yeah. like disgust when you said Dana Morales next week. She's a oh. scammer, right? As soon as you said scammer, you went like this, scammer. So even we leak body language. So you're probably at home reading us as well. So I, I thought that she does disgust me, I'm going to say. Yeah. <laughs> Great job, Lena. All right, guys, listen, thank you all and have a wonderful night. Bye. See you next time. Bye, we love you. Okay, Patreon ambassadors, we do a drawing for you guys to win a book or a free session with us every month. So I'm gonna pick the winner this month. And I do have all of your names in here. So we're just gonna throw it on my table here and I'm gonna close my eyes and I have the lucky winner, Amy. So you won and you can either win a free session with us or one of our books. So I'll reach out to you on Patreon. Woo